Before I get to the theme of this talk, Gluing Curves Along Their Torsion, I, or rather, to the motivation for this theme, I want to mention that this is joint work with Jeroen Hanselman, who used to work at Ulm University, and uh, Sam Skirvon, who works at MIT. At the end of the talk, I will mention a different way of viewing the results in it that they developed and that is more geometric than what I'm about to explain. But that is for later. For now, I just want to tell you uh, what is the theme of this talk. And I figured that since it's Monday morning and we're all tired and to get up early, I would tell you something about the equality 1 plus 2 is equal to 3 and motivate this by the equality 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 as a warm up. And not do this in complete generality. That's also a bit uh, much perhaps, but I want to do this in a specific context which I will explain to you now. The context is that of abelian varieties. And the motivating theorem is that of Poincaré reducibility. I will not prove this theorem because it's sort of known, but I will just tell you what it is and what we will do with it. So what we will do is, um, well, let's start with an abelian variety A over some base field. Throughout, I will denote this base field by a small k. Poincaré reducibility tells you that given A, you can sort of decompose it. More precisely, you can write up to an isogeny, up to a map with finite kernel. You can write A as a product of, well, of other varieties, Bi, up to certain powers where these Bi are simple. That is, they have no abelian subvarieties over K, well, no proper abelian subvarieties, and where they are pairwise non isogenous. So, this is similar to factoring, if you will, ideals in data kindlings. And the same kind of uniqueness applies. The BI, or rather their isogeny classes, they are uniquely determined, as are the powers, well, of course, up to the usual permutation of the factors. And the goal is sort of to try to and understand this theorem in both directions. That is to say, starting from A to move to the right-hand side, but the main theme actually is to do it the other way around, to start with a bunch of factors and to construct a corresponding abelian variety, A. That is the goal today. Moreover, most of the time you're interested in a more specific situation, namely that where this a B in variety, A, is the Jacobian of a curve over K. And in that case, ideally, you would also like these Bi, the factors, to be curve, uh, Jacobians of curves over K themselves. And the reason for that is simple, because you can then analyze arithmetic information on Z, say it's L functions and whatnot, in terms of these curves of smaller genus. Conversely, if you start with this bi and you can construct a corresponding abelian variety A that gives rise to this decomposition, then you can give it certain properties if you know that your input curves fulfill them. So that is kind of the motivation to say something about curves of higher genus on this side by saying something about curves on this side. And as I told you, um, this works in both directions. Yeah, and equality is, or um, an isomorphism is literally a bridge from one way to another. Let's go in both directions. And one direction that I will tell you about first is the general direction of going from the left-hand side from a given abelian variety A, realized as a Jacobian perhaps, to these factors. That is what I want to tell you about now. That's not the main theme, but I want to recall this to you because sort of similar methods work. We look at this in the case where this base field K is a number field. That is mostly because in that case, the results with Edgar, with Nicolas, and with John make it possible to really determine the decomposition that I just wrote. 
at least as long as these factors bi are of small dimension. Yeah. And what you do for this is you, that you determine, first of all, the endomorphism ring end of A. So this is the endomorphism ring. And you do that heuristically at first by calculating the period matrix of the Z. Because given a curve Z, you know what this abelian variety looks like over C. Over C, this abelian variety A is nothing but a complex torus. That is to say, it is the quotient of C to the power G, where G is a genus of this curve Z by a lattice. And this lattice is nothing but P Z to the power G. And what P is here is a period matrix for, for Z. That is to say, P is some matrix, well, with special properties that I will not mention, with entries in C. And the nice thing is, and I always like to mention this, that by now you can really um, determine these matrices P quickly given the curve Z by work due to Pascal Moulin and Christian Neuroy. The work with that I mentioned on this slide as well as the work today could not have been done without these results. All right, so suppose you have this matrix P, yeah, this period matrix. How then do we determine this endomorphism ring of A? Well, the idea is the following. You find a basis, a Z basis, of pairs T R such that the following holds, such that you have the TP is PR. And what are these T and R? They are certain matrices. T is a matrix that is G by G with entries in C. On the other hand, R has entries in Z. And these are the representation, uh, the um, yeah, the representations of the corresponding anamorphisms on the tangent space and on the homology of the anamorphism. And yeah, um, R determines T, and conversely, and the ring is given as an abelian group as a span of a certain finite basis of such T and R. And you can determine those uh, using LLL. And then it turns out that these T are in fact already algebraic. They are defined over Q bar. And if you then take invariance, you can actually find the anamorphism ring over the base group. So this is just something where you take an analytic detour. Then you find the anamorphism ring of A, at least heuristically. And you do it up to a certain precision and you're pretty sure you're correct. Okay, and then you just continue. Once you have this endomorphism ring, you find idempotence in it or rather in the corresponding endomorphism algebra. And what you then do is you take the image under those idempotence, which you can do on the level of matrices, for example, by just multiplying out. And you get at first period matrices corresponding to the factors bi. And the nice thing is that if, you, if your genus is small, then results by Guardia in genus two, and um, well, a small twist of results with Lercet and uh, with Renard and Christophe, they allow you to recover the corresponding curve over K again, over the base field. And I think that this theme of rec recovering curves will also be mentioned later in this conference by Niels, I think. Um, or at least I recall that this was in the abstracts. Anyway, you can recover the um, corresponding curves. And that is all heuristic up to this point. And then there is also a little machine that allows you to determine, to verify that this is correct, basically by finding a curve that covers both algebraically and then checking that you indeed get the requested item potent from that. Well, I don't want to talk about that. The key is you cheat your way around by just saying, okay, I'm going to look over C 
do everything there and then later justify what I did. And that is also something that we will do today. So that is how the general decomposition goes by a detour over C. Now, of course, you would also like to go in the other direction. You would like to glue factors together. You can ask a question, given factors bi and powers di, can I find a corresponding Jacobian or not? So you go the other direction. And this is the context for one plus one equals two at first, because uh, let's do this for the simplest case. And that is the case where you have two elliptic curves, E1 and E2, and you want to see if this product here is isogenous to the Jacobian of a genus two curve. And well, there is results on this. This is from 30 years ago by Fay and Kani, and they're pretty, pretty complete results. The statement is, suppose you have two elliptic curves, E1 and E2 over the base field K, and you fix an integer N. Well, they say that you can do this whole thing, provided that you have a certain datum on your hands. And it is, well, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it is a, an anti-symplectic isomorphism between the N torsion of your elliptic curves, which should also be Galois equivariant. Anti-symplectic means anti-symplectic with respect to the Vey pairings on, the side, on both sides here. Galois equivariant in the usual sense, that it respects Galois conjugation. The statement is then, now consider the graph of G in the M torsion of the product. Then you can do the following. You just look at this product and you divide out this group G. And then you can hope that this is indeed a Jacobian. This is reasonable because you have made it anti-symplectic and it turns out that that condition ensures that this group G here is a so-called maximal isotropic subgroup. And that means that this quotient in fact inherits a principal polarization, a bit of technical structure that allows you to hope that it is indeed Jacobian. Moreover, the Galois equivariance bit assures, ensures that this group G is defined over your base field K. So you can really hope it's a Jacobian over K. And generically, it really is. Um, for example, let's take our, well, you can take your favorite number, which of course is two. And then you take, um, you can actually say when this happens. Um, yeah, Z exists. If, for example, the following condition is satisfied, if phi, is not the restriction of a map of an actual isomorphism between these elliptic curves. So that's out. You can't do that, but anything else is all right. There's nothing induced on a torsion by this. So that's a relatively complete answer in, this, in that case. Well, you can also ask, what about one plus one plus one is equal to three? That's also um, not uninteresting. That is work from 20 years ago by how Le Prévost and Poonen. They start with three elliptic curves and they find the corresponding genus three curve. And they do a similar thing. They, well, they look at the two torsion as will we in fact today, we don't do it quite generally, but they look at the two torsion and in there, they make a, do a similar thing. They find a maximal isotropic group that is k-rational. And you play the same game. You look at this product, you divide out this group. You can hope it's a Jacobian over k because the group is maximal isotropic, ensuring that this quotient is principally polarized, this small tool that you need, and it's k-rational. So the quotient is defined over k. You can hope it's a Jacobian over k, and it turns out to be a Jacobian. Just the problem is that in general, this only holds over K bar. It's a little technical obstruction and we'll get back to that in detail later. I just want to mention that in this case, Z, this curve that you get out is a pretty special plane quartic curve. It is so-called Chiani quartic. It is a large automorphism group. It is a plane quartic curve defined by an equation, say of the following type. You can think of an equation like X to the fourth, 
I'm just writing down a sample, not for any particular reason, but this is what you can think of, an equation like this. So these are pretty special curves, but you can do loads with them. You can, for example, find elliptic curves with rational torsion of, of order up to 864, which is pretty neat. We'll be doing something similar. Okay, so let's glue elliptic curves together. What about an elliptic curve and a genus two curve? Well, so in fact, that's why I said one plus two is equal to three at the uh, beginning. Let's first do, let's first do three is equal to one plus two. That is to say, let's first go the other way. We start with a genus three curve Z. We try to decompose it or rather it's Jacobian as a product of other Jacobians. And for that, we consider a degree two map from this genus three curve to a genus one curve X. And I suppose that Z is non-hyperliptic. That is to say, it's a plane curve. It's again defined by a term with quadratic equation. You will see what such a degree two curve looks, curve looks like in general in a bit. I just want to mention, if you have such a map, it turns out that you can make this decomposition happen. And the first thing that you have to realize is that if you are given such a map, let's call it P, the projection, then you get associated to this a pullback map from the Jacobian of X to the Jacobian of Z. And that's an injection and it gives you a factor, a genus one, uh, sorry, a dimension one part. Now, what about the complement? Can I describe that? Can I describe this part over here? And yes, it turns out that you can because there's work by... Um, Jeroen? Yeah. There's a question here. Very good. I mean, I don't know if it's exactly... This is the point with the, the, the chat. There's a question by uh, Fabian Pazuki. And he asked, over what field do you find the 864 pure torsion points? I think it's over Q, right? I think they're all over Q, yes. Yeah. So it's not a, thing, a torsion point on this order, but it's a torsion group and it's defined over that. Mm -hmm. I don't quite recall if the group is defined over Q or all the points. I, 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 I believe that, that the torsion is over Q, but I can look it up for after the talk. Yeah, I've, it, it escaped me. But it is this either for the group or for the points. And I think for the latter. Yeah, so really point-wise. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe this kind of general questions I'll keep until the end, but we'll see how, how this works with the chat. This was, since it was the first question, I wanted to enter, to stop you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. It, leads to, it, it doesn't lead to elliptic curves. I don't know how that got in. The, 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 the jack of Z has it. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know how that happens. Jack Z has this. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, yes. So it turns out that by this work, by Christopher Mathieu, you can um, describe the complement. The complement is the Jacobian of a curve, genus two, that you can write down explicitly. Just the small subtlety, it may only happen over K bar in general, but it will be defined over K if, over the ground field K, Z admits an equation of this form, where this F and A they, sorry, the F and H, they are of degree two. And in that case, I can also tell you very concretely what this map to X looks like. Probably you can guess it already. The map to X is nothing but quotienting out the involution. That is to say, you now get a curve in weighted projective two, one, one space. And I hope that you agree that this is indeed a genus one curve. And the reason for that is that if you complete the square, you get something of the form x squared is a quartic, and that's genus one. So it's not it's not a very daunting to look at this. It's, this is how they look like. Okay, now we want to go the other way, and now I can describe the result. So we are after inverting this. You take a Jacobian of x and a Jacobian of y, and you want to find an associated curve z. X is of genus one, Y is of genus two, and I also suppose that the characteristic of the ground field is not equal to two. Now here's the result. There are two steps to it, and this is also how, how I will partition the rest of the talk. The first step is that you determine K rational in decomposable maximal isotropic subgroups of this two torsion. Again, there is a number of conditions. 
maximal isotropic, so that the quotient has a principal polarization as before, k rational, so that's defined over k, and you also want it to be indecomposable. That is not a product itself, not the product of factors in these parts, because then you don't, you cannot get the Jacobian. The statement is you can describe these. Moreover, if you are given such a group, then you can also find a curve Z explicitly with a little twist, literally, because it turns out that if you now divide out this group G, you get a Jacobian of a curve over the base field, but in order to really get this isogeny over K, you have to twist it a bit. You have to take a quadratic twist of that Jacobian with respect to a certain scalar that is well determined up to a square. Yeah, and the construction is just as before. You take your product, and you quotient out this subgroup. The fact that it is maximum isotropic ensures that it has a principal polarization. The fact that it is K rational and the, that um, it is defined over K and then it turns out you really do get a Jacobian, except that there is this twist, which I will tell you about. So there are two steps. We want to find G, we want to describe these G, how do you make this uh, tangible? And given G, how do you find Z and mu? So that's the theme of the next two parts. Let's first talk about G. So yeah, as I said, we determine those K-rational maximal isotropic subgroups that are not products, because then, the quotient is the final over k and principally polarized. I'm first going to look at the maximal isotropic property. And to make that concrete, instead of just an abstract definition, I want to give you a more concrete definition of the two torsion in the various Jacobians. And here's what you do. Suppose that I want to describe the two torsion of my genus 1 curve x. Yeah, x was of genus 1. And I can then choose the funny equation. Say y squared is equal to px, and px then is four roots over k bar in general, not over k usually. Um, all right, those four roots gives you give you four special points with y coordinate zero, the ai comma zero. Now I call these four points p, and we're just going to play a game with these points because it turns out to be relevant. Look at this thing called gp. And it is the set of subsets of these four special points of even cardinality. And you consider them up to a certain equivalence, namely you, you identify a set with its uh, complement. Now that turns out to be an F2 vector space under the symmetric difference, taking union minus the, uh, how do you call it, the intersection. So that makes it an F2 vector space. And it also has a symplectic pairing. Namely, if you have two such sets, you just look at what the cardinality of this quotient is, sorry, of its intersection is modulo two. That turns out to work. Okay, I can define what I want and you will see that it is relevant too. later. First, I just say you can play exactly the same game with Y. Y was a genus two curve, meaning that usually you can describe it by a, uh, a sextic equation. Take these six roots, call the set Q and play exactly the same game. You, you form GQ and you do it exactly as before. Sets of even cardinality up to an equivalence and they have this special structure. And of course it is for, did that for a reason because this very innocent game of playing with these subset that turns out to give you um, the two torsion in a Jacobian. There is an isomorphism between these groups so GP, that group with uh, coming from those four points, that describes you your two torsion in the Jacobian of X. Same thing for Q, for Q, the six special points, and then taking the subset, et cetera, forming this group GQ will give you something that is uh, well, canonically isomorphic with Jack Y2. And these are symplectic isomorphisms. Huh? So they are also symplectic with respect to the V pairing on the right-hand side. So it makes this V pairing very concrete. Now you can just describe it in terms of intersections. Everything becomes simple. And as I state below, it goes like this. 
if someone comes to you with a subset of cardinality two, you just send it to the following two torsion point in the Jacobian P1 minus P2. That is indeed a two torsion point because in fact, if you multiply it by two, it will be a um, the divisor of this particular function. Okay, so that describes the two torsion and I also need something more technical. Namely, let's do the following. I'm going to take to look at this genus two part. And remember this had six points, huh? With six points in Q. And I, I just pick out two. I call it set T. Now by the very thing that I mentioned before, such a set T will give rise to a point because you will get T1, T2. It will give you a two torsion point now in the genus two part. Yeah, and hence a subgroup H of cardinality two. So this H here has cardinality two. And then you can ask, what if I throw away these two points from Q? Well, then of course I end up with something of cardinality four. And it turns out that there is a, that this, if you then form the same group on this, on these points, you get that it's isomorphic to the perpendicular of H with respect to the weight pairing modulo H. And right now you can't see why I do that, but you will see on the next slide because it's relevant in order to describe what we are after. Because now I can tell you, at least I can tell you without the K rationality that giving an indecomposable maximal isotropic subgroup of the two torsion, you can describe this in, by, in terms of the game that we just played. You have to take a subset T of these six points. So <coughs> two points out of six for the genus two part. And you have to give a symplectic isomorphism between um, the group on these four points for the elliptic, or sorry, for the genus one curve and the four remaining points. And I'll br briefly sketch how this goes. Um, because G, it turns out that um, given such a structure, so T along with, what I call it L, G is the graph of the following. We'll take a function from jack x2 to jack y2. And what you do is you say, well, I have, you have just seen that we can make this concrete had a two torsion. And let's take a point in there given by uh, this subset. Well, I just map that to, the, to its image under L. And I know that this image lands in, remember the H perp modulo H. Now, the thing is that is not an actual function. It's a multi-valued function. So it is determined up to H. But well, multi-valued functions are functions too. And um, that is what you do. That is what your G is. And it has the right cardinality because this is an isomorphism you get four points here. So you get four things here out and the indeterminacy in H gives you a factor two. It is indeed eight, which is the right size for this maximum isotropic subgroup. So that makes it concrete in terms of the roots of what this maximum isotropic subgroup is. Uh, you just have to pick out two roots here and furnish this isomorphism. But well, this is always possible because there is just one, um, symplectic vector space of dimension two, the subtle bit is the K rationality. And for that, I quickly have to tell you something about Galois theory. Suppose that someone comes at you uh, with a quartic polynomial. Well, then you can form another polynomial. And it's called the so-called cubic resolvent of this polynomial. And what this resolvent does is, well, it has these roots. And by virtue of that, it turns out that it describes the Galois action on the pairs of roots of P up to complements. That's sort of, you can sort of see this from the, what, this, what these roots look like. And that is relevant because these pairs of roots up to complements, well, that was nothing but what we considered when we looked at GP or more precisely when we looked at it and then we move zero. Those are actually three points. 
Yeah, four minus one is three. Okay, that describes the Galois structure, and that's all that we need then. And if you then flash, uh, how do you say? If you then uh, determine what this all means, um, for this to be K rational, you get the main theorem on these subgroups. And here it is. There exists. This group has all these properties, maximize entropic and indecomposable, and also K rational, if the following holds. First of all, you want PY to admit a quadratic factor QY over K. Because what this does is it picks out two roots of your defining polynomial, and that then gives rise to the subgroup T of cardinality two inside of Q. Inside a set of special points Q. That's one. And then you also need this symplectic isomorphism, remember? And the thing is now, of course, you want it to be Galois equivariant. And if you look at this, it turns out this is possible. It is possible to determine such a Galois equivariant isomorphism if the following holds. You look at the polynomial Px with its four roots. And you look at the polynomial Ry, and that is just the polynomial the, that is left when you divide out QI, QY, which has these other four roots as the zeros. And um, yeah, and you just have to check that the cubic resolvents of those two quartic polynomials define isomorphic splitting fields. So this furnishes you your L. So that answers one question. Then you will have your group G. And as I mentioned, you're not quite done that because then, because if you have such a group G, you can form the quotient and it is generically a Jacobian, but not over K. And there was a theme by Bovee and Ritzenthaler that says exactly um, what happens. If you have something, a principally polarized abelian threefold over K that is not a product of a K bar, which we have now generically in short, then you do get to the corresponding curve over K, but to get Q out, you may have to twist by this scalar mu. That is all something that we saw before in the statement of the theorem. And also, in fact, I hit that, but it was also with how the Prevost and Poonen. Okay, so now we are after this Z and mu. I want to be able to find Z and mu such that this holds. If I divide out G, a G, K rational and whatnot, I want to find these things. Again, we're going to cheat. We're going to go to C first by using period lattices. And what you do is you, you think very carefully about what it means to have a period lattice. Period lattices, if you have a really distinguished period lattices, that turns out to give you quite a lot of information. Namely, for example, if your genus is two, then you can look at the hyperliptic curve, but let's not just look at it up to isomorphism, all right? Let's look at it in the following way that someone really gives you an equation, a distinguished equation. If someone gives you an equation, you get a basis of global differentials of this kind. It is picked out by it. From that, you get a distinguished period that is just the integrals of those differentials with respect to the homology. And it turns out that you can, in fact, recover the equation from this. That's a neat part. Yeah? So the, the complex data that you have, it really allows you to recover the equation, which may be arithmetic. And that's a proposition. If you have the period that is, well, with the syntactic pairing, I don't want to talk about that, then you can recover a defining polynomial. And that's neat. We're going to use that. And we're also going to do this in genus 3. It's exactly the same thing. Except that it's not because you look at ternary defining equations instead of y squared equals blah. But anyway, from a defining from a distinguished equation, you get global differentials. You can play the same game, and it turns out that this time, from the period lattice, you can recover the equation up to a sign. That's not weird because minus f defines. Yeah, if you just multiply it by that, you get the same differentials up to a sign. It will give the same lattice. But that's the only thing. 
But well, a sign is still a sign. And in fact, it is exactly this sign that makes uh, Bovi and Ritzenthaler happen, makes this twist occur. Anyway, now we have considered what it means to have a period lattice. It's a very special thing. It really picks out an equation and we're going to use that in the following way. <clears throat> we're going to do this. I'm going to look at very special curves. I'm going to look out particularly defined equations of a special kind. This is my genus one factor. This is my genus two factor. And you can see that from this, I already have a distinguished factor QI. Huh? For example, I have picked out a quadratic factor already. Moreover, there's also a distinguished G that is picked out because not only do I have a quadratic factor, I can also indicate a very special isomorph uh, synthetic isomorphism between um, the roots. Because here I have these four roots. And so though I have four roots here, and I just take the map that sends these things to the things that they're above. That's a symplectic isomorphism. It picks out one special symplectic isomorphism. All right, and now you just go and calculate. You find the period lattices corresponding to X and Y. You form a corresponding over lattice because it turns out that their work also allows you via abel jacobi functionality to find a lattice corresponding to the quotient by G. And then you can, using theta values, uh, work due to Laponde makes this possible, you can find a Weber model corresponding to lambda z, or at least a curve that up to a transformation of the ambient has the right period lattice. But that's the whole thing. I just told you that we can just transform back. And if you take, if you transform this curve back, then you will have a distinguished defining equation of the kind that I told you before. And because everything is so canonical, that should be neat. So you find a defining polynomial Fz that has exactly this period lattice. And if you do it for this particular family, this comes out. It's a bit large, but it's not ugly. And you can still write it down. Not like the things that I will do later. I'm sorry. But you see that you get something. And it's not ugly in the sense that you, for example, see that this is a function that is completely in terms of x squared. You see an involution sitting there, huh? That's neat. That's very encouraging. And now you just go all out. You just do it for four roots arbitrary for the genus one part and four arbitrary roots for the genus two part. You have to sit down a bit harder for this to make this work, but you can, you can do it. And it turns out that you get a, an interpolated curve Z whose coefficients only involve those of PX and PY and not the roots. The only thing that you need is the root of the cubic resolvent, which is in line with our results. Okay, so that's a, that gives you a curve Z. And in fact, it has a rather terrible equation. I can't write it down. It, it's, it's about a megabyte large, but it is there. We do have to verify that it is correct though. I did all of that over C, huh? I mean, I can say this is beautiful, it can't be wrong, but that's not mathematics. How do you show that it is correct? Well, it turns out that the curves that you, you get out, again, has this nice involution. And you can check that if you divide out this involution, then you do get your genus one factor back. You can also get the genus two factor back by applying it some talent Roman G and just checking that you get the right thing. And it turns out that you do, except that you don't because it's true up to twist only. There, the problem is that if you do it over a ground field and not just over C, there is this, yeah, this factor in front of the defining polynomial that still um, throws soot into the water, as we say in Dutch, uh, that still gives you problems. Anyway, but you can undo this. And this is the last technical cherry on the cake. Um, I have to have to make a few definitions. Remember that if you have a genus one curve and a genus two curve over a ground field, then you have quadratic twists. Huh? If you have y squared equals a polynomial, you just consider y squared equals mu times a polynomial instead. That's the way to twist. And you can also do that for genus three curve with a special form by just looking at this instead. And there was a twist with respect to minus one. And it turns out that you can exactly describe what happens. If you start out with an isogeny of this kind, 
then if you apply a twist by minus one, both factors get affected. Whereas if you do this other kind of twist, only one does. And that means that you can untwist anything you like. Yeah, you just apply this one so that X turns out all right, and then you untwist in the other factor. And that, the combination of that, makes it possible to get an actual equality um, over the base field. So if we take our Z, which only worked up to twist, then we can still um, save it by these two kind of twists. And after that, the corresponding quotient by our nice group G will furnish with the aid of these twists an actual isomorphism over K. And that's wonderful. And that is something that you can get out in our implementation of which I will show an example. But I quickly re repeat what we did. So the steps were, you find this group that you have to divide, divide out algebraically via the criterion, and that's the criterion over the base field. Then using period matrices, you can get a curve Z over here. And that is just a universal formula and you verify afterwards it works over any field of characteristic not equal to two. And by twisting appropriately, you can actually make it true over the base that there is this isomorphism. And then you have what you want. You have your Jacobian of X and Jacobian of Y as factors of this thing over here. Let's do an example to conclude. And that is an example of a genus one curve that I wrote down here. That has a rational five torsion point. I just found it in the LMFDB. And we also take a genus two curve Y, which is a rational 14 torsion point, or you know, the Jacobian does, but you know what I mean. And now you see that you are in business because the this defining polynomial does have a quadratic factor QY. Mm -hmm. And the complement here. Well, if you look at its uh, cubic resolvent, then it has the same cubic resolvent as this thing. So there is a corresponding group G. And you can turn the crank. You just feed it to the algorithm and it spits out something, namely this. And I should mention, and it's a nice thing, I didn't do anything to make this equation nicer. Right? There is no Photoshopping or, or you know, polishing to make it fit on the page. No, this just comes out like that. And that's a nice thing because everything is so canonical that this sort of has to be beautiful. The only thing is that the twisting scalar is five to the third. Well, that could have been five too, but you can't have everything. Well, now because there's a degree eight isogeny, you at least know that there's a rational 35 torsion point because there's five here and seven here. And if you analyze it a bit more, you get a two torsion point as well. And you win because you have something of order 70. I want to mention briefly that uh, Everett told me that um, there is also an example, 70 torsion in genus two, which he found. And I, 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 we were not aware of this, but the nice thing is that this example of his has the property that the defining polynomial has a quadratic factor. So you can glue it with even something even larger and you can get something bigger out. We haven't done that yet, but that would be cool. Okay, so now you have seen it, and you can do this for any two of your favorite curves. The algorithms will just tell you if you can do, and it will give you those equations. I want to mention one final thing to conclude, and that is an alternative method to proceed. It is a geometric method that was developed by uh, Jeroen and Sam, starting at Baskerville Hall in Wales, because it turns out that you can also recover Z geometrically. Had we cheated our whole way around and we justified it in the retrospect, but could you have done it in a, in a geometric fashion? And well, there is one, because what you do for that is that you take this genus two part, there's a Jacobian and the Jacobian, which is a, of dimension two, has a kuma, the quotient by minus one. You look at that kuma or more precisely, more finicky, it's dual. That's why there is a T here. And then it turns out that you can realize X, your genus one curve, as a, an intersection of this Kummer with a hyperplane in P3. The Kummer is in a P3. 
And that gives you this arrow here, X as a hyperplane section. And then what you do is just do is you take the pullback of the two to one cover of the Jacobian, you restrict it to Z. That, you, that gives you a two to one cover, and that gives you Z2. And that's a geometric construction of it. And Jeroen right now is on the postdoc market, and I'm sure he'll be happy to tell you about this um, um, geometric construction in your colloquium or in your seminar. So I won't be telling you any more about this. I just want to tell you that there are algorithms available. You can put in your curves and they will tell you whether or not you can glue them and give you an equation. So the machine is there and you can use it. And um, we have seen what goes into it. And I think that is where I will stop my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jeroen, for your very, very nice talk. We also have nice clap smileys here. So are there any questions? For me, it's easiest if you just put a question or something or cue in the chat, because I cannot look at everything at the same time. But I'm sure the organizers will also see if you put something in the reactions. So questions for you, Ron. By the way, uh, Drew put the equation of the, the uh, genus three curve that we uh, discussed during the talk in the chat, if you want to look at it. I'm not going to read it. Yeah, that. so it's really the points and not the group itself. The points are individually yes, yes. of a cube. Okay, who has a question for you, Ron? We need to really... Someone, someone. So um, I do have a question, uh, but Marco has a question. So let's start with Marco. Okay. Okay, well, it might not be a very uh, enlightened question, but I was just wondering what's next? Because, uh, yeah, if you do two genus one curves and then three and then a genus one and a genus two, the, there are infinitely many possibilities. Yeah. So, uh, is there anything you're planning to do next in this direction? Well, uh, you is the one who is mainly looking at this, and he is, well, there are, to start with, you can do this with three torsion as well, except that then there is no general formula. That is much more difficult to find, but the algorithms still work and he is working on making those um, accessible. And you can also do the special case, for example, where this where it gives rise to hyperelliptic curves instead of um, um, plane cortex. So there are these things to consider. Moreover, um, there's also, for example, gluing genus two to genus two and seeing if you can get a Jacobian of genus four out. And Dune also has ideas on this that he's developing. But yeah, that is mainly, that is where he is going. I don't know if he's in the, he might be there with, the, he is with Bogdan, but maybe he has condiments, but yeah, he is working on these subjects. So yeah, the, 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 the thing would be to go to higher genus, so two plus two is four. <laughs> you also like to do that. And uh, yeah, the more general torsion as well. But let's keep it modest. And first you want, you cannot expect to have a formula for every N. Uh, that is just in, unfeasible. The torsion becomes too difficult to describe. But yeah, to, to complement, to complete that and to also do the, the hyperliptic case. Thanks. First, we, yeah. we have a second question by Samueli. Yeah, since it's the same microphone, I will let Elisa go first. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Irene. Uh, Jeroen, you saw it was nice like this. So you started with the genus two curve, analytic curve. You gave the decomposition. So you had these beta alphas and you glued them together. And yep. then you got this nice equation that you saw, this plain quartic. Mm -hmm. And my question is, can it happen that actually what you get is a genus three hyperelliptic curve instead of a plain quartic when there is oh. like two of the parameters or something? Yeah, it can definitely happen. This is what happens generically. Yeah? You get a plain quartic out, but you may get a hyperelliptic curve. And in fact, it happens when the following occurs. You have this genus one in this genus two curve, huh? And um, the genus one curve gives you four roots, these four two, well, not two torsion points, but the four, I don't know if they're wires, no, you can't say wires first either, but you know, these four special points. And you look at their um, cross ratio, 
And what you want is that it is also the cross ratio of four of the points for this genus two curve. That is the exact condition under which you get a hyperelliptic curve as a blue wing instead of a plain quartet. That can happen. And of course you may just get unlucky and you may get a product. But yeah, so there is a closed condition for hyperelliptic to happen and usually it's avoided, but it may happen. Okay, uh, and you also have like a nice equation, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So we directly continue in the same mic with Samueli. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, I have two questions actually. So the first one is, uh, what does happen if your um, and your composable mass sigma isotropy subgroup G uh, is not defined over K, so it's not K rational, but mm -hmm. it, uh, over some extension, does that mean that the Jacobian Z that you get uh, is over that extension or you need another extension again? Well, I mean, you cannot meaningfully say that, yeah, yeah, this, this quotient will then typically not only be defined of this extension. So your Q is, sorry, let's look up. Yeah. So you have this Q, which is the, the quotient by this group G. And that Q will only be naturally defined over an extension if your group is. There is no longer any, okay, you may get, something strange may happen, but there is no natural reason for the Q to be defined over K itself. So yeah, then the Q, is defined over an extension and you may, you know, but, but then you can still do the same thing over the extension, of course. And then you can over the extension still find the Jacobian and you get the same thing out. You just get a mu and, uh, and the Z, but they are then over the extension. You don't need to do anything extra. So, so you say that it's the same field where you're defining G or you may need a quadratic extension because of the twist? Sorry? So a priori, uh, you will get the same extension over where G is defined, or you will make yeah. the quadratic It extension. is always the extent, yeah, oh, where G is defined. And um, the, what the algorithms do is that, that you give your curves over a, uh, a certain field, and it will look over that field. But if you, yeah, um, you could also give it over an extension, maybe one particular one that interests you, and it would do it over there as well. It can do it can do with any number of you with any field, so that will just go through. Thank you very and much. If, um, sorry, uh, go on. Oh, sorry, you somebody you still have a question? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so the other question is just more like a remark. Uh, I think Iron is uh, you know well about this uh, business of uh, clusters and the work of Morgan Mistre in Dorchester and Dorchester. So your curly G of P, to me, it looks like almost uh, an uber-even cluster. There what? Uber-even cluster. Well, it's a cluster, I think. If you pick a prime P where you have like semi-stable reduction, if you can find one, uh, you will. Mm -hmm. uh, then your curly G of P of Q, uh, those are clusters with all the relations that you have. Have you looked into that? No, I don't, no not yet. But the cluster... Mm. But GP is up to complements, yeah? Is it also true for their clusters? I mean, you can do that. Maybe somewhere like it's this. It's very similar to what Elisa and I and all our co-authors did for this Chani case. And of course, one one can because this clusters is the same as looking at the admissible cover case. And by just describing the the map maps down to P one, I'm sure you can do it. But it's it's getting really complicated. But we can discuss it maybe at some other point. Sorry, you don't know. No, that's fine. I haven't looked into this myself, so it's good that you yeah. say this. <laughs> so, yeah, this cluster is just another way of do, looking at the, the ramification locus of the of the maps from the genus two and the genus one to down to P one, and of course you can do the reduction. There's a further question by Robert Robert Schlop. I think I think we only have one Robert. Yeah, so I also have one question. Um, you sort of talked about a closed formula, which was one megabyte megabyte large. And then in this example, I don't know, but too big. And then, then in this example, you have this very nice uh, yeah, formula, actually. So I was sort of wondering, this one megabyte, was this about the actual equation for Z? Or was, or how did you get to, like, like how did this very large uh, formula turn this very small? Uh, I don't know. It, it always happens. It's just that, um, yeah, it's weird. Uh, this just... Sorry, I have to look. I think it's a bit further to the right. 
I think so too. But I am looking at the, for a particular slide. Um, yeah, this one. So it is after this step that you get this large expression, huh? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I we did um, when we look when we found these uh, equations, we did make sure to symmetrize them. Huh? So the, the 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 formula is not in terms of the alpha i and beta i because then it gets even bigger. We made sure to symmetrize that there are really expressions in the coefficients of px and py and some root of the cubic resolvent. But the, uh, the expressions are large, but they are canonical. And it's just because it's canonical that you should expect the result to be nice, even though it looks very large if you write it out formally in the coefficients of px and py. Mm -hmm. There is probably something behind this having to do with, um, uh, how do you say, with algebraic theta functions that may give you another insight into why this goes so well and why these, um, yeah, these expressions that we found and that are very large when you write them out, why they should in fact become small. Perhaps there's sort of some kind of determinants of matrices involving algebraic theta functions, but I didn't, well, we didn't look at, at this. Yeah, so I don't know. That's also open. <laughs> but it, you, the the, the um, intuition is it works out because it's canonical. So if you put in two beautiful things, something beautiful comes out. That's really Perfect. what it is. Are there any more questions? Yeah, Christoph. Uh -huh. Hello? I don't have to speak with this microphone. Yes, yes, yes. Also with the same. I think we get all, almost all the questions from one microphone. Yeah. Right, we recognize the room. Anyway, <laughs> just pass to. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to react about this last comment because somehow, I mean, in uh, one article with Lachaud, when we were, we were trying to analyze uh, the serial structures, then we did a bit this game, meaning that we took the same um, setting as uh, Howell and Prevost Poonen. Of three elliptic curves and doing the quotient by uh, uh, a symplectic uh, a subgroup of the two torsion. And then we were working out exactly the cell's obstruction in terms of the theta. And I, I, I was thinking that uh, an alternative way of having this twisting factor would be to do the same game, starting with the elliptic curves and the Jacobian of the Jennings two curve and working out uh, how the duplication formulas act on the thetas to obtain exactly the same kind of uh, formula. And maybe then you would see that indeed you get uh, big factors in terms of the theta to high power of something much more compact, I would say. Yeah, probably. But indeed, I mean, it's a long and difficult computation anyway. So yeah, that would require a lot of work. Yeah, yeah thanks. That's... Yeah, I know too little about this, but yeah, it's. Probably one can say something about it. Just not me. 